Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, where we help you manage your growing engineering team. Through expert interviews, we help you navigate the challenges of leading, hiring, growing, and nurturing your tech team to deliver the value your customers demand. Brought to you by agilityfeet.com, experts in staffing engineering teams in Latin America for clients globally. And it's interesting that uh, roughly two out of three projects fail on some significant point. You know, whether that, that failure is an outright failure, they pull the plug on it, or a failure in terms of not of going over budget or over schedule. Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, the podcast for leaders of growing software engineering teams. I'm Aaron Syme, here with my co-host, David Alfaro. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing fine. Well, a little bit frustrated because in my dear country of Costa Rica, we have now three weeks of having the tax system down because uh. it, was, it was hacked <laughs> and and they don't have they don't have a clue how to get out of it it's so fascinating <laughs> three weeks and and all the all the business people is just losing money by 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 millions and oh, i am just I mean, it's software. I know it's complicated, but right, three weeks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it. That's crazy. I mean, it's it, what a what an impact on on obviously the country on you know tax collection, which the country needs presumably, and also I mean just the the hassle that that causes for business owners there, and and because they're still going to have to pay them eventually, I assume, right? They're probably not getting a tax holiday <laughs> out of this. <laughs> exactly, and I think that relates to. To the episode that we that, that we yes. just had, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk today with Professor Ryan Nelson from the University of Virginia about IT project management and infamous failures. And you have already highlighted uh, a a a infamous failure happening right now in, right. in Costa Rica. Uh, what what's something what's something you want our listeners to look out for uh, in this episode today? Well, in general, it's very hard to find an academic that is that is um, connected with reality. I mean, <laughs> right. I, I, I I always complain that I, at least in my country, I don't find an academic that that is not ten years behind of reality. It's, <laughs> right. it, it, it's, 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 it's just frustrating, and and I enjoyed very much. That because when you find an academic that is connected with the current reality, then you see someone that is trying to look f- all the situation from from uh, from a very high perspective and trying to make sense of things and trying to predict the future and trying to come up with things and trying to collaborate and to really give uh, new new knowledge to 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 the market to the industry. Yeah. So I felt that with uh, uh, Professor Nelson, it was a great conversation yeah. uh, regarding the, his perspective uh, 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 from uh, from being a professor that, that is really concerned about pro- projects and products, uh, yeah. value delivery. And, and the other thing I was impressed, uh, I have to admit, is uh, his insights about scaling. He yes. had many things to say about scaling. Uh, so I, I recommend you guys to stay to the end because he said that at the end of the episode, actually, so it's, <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, I think those are those are great points, and yeah, he, he I have, I've learned a lot of great practical advice uh, from him, and and that is uh, always very encouraging in an academic setting for sure. I agree, and 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 I'll just call out too to our listeners to look out for the conversation around the importance of. Uh, understanding the strategy and goals of your project that came up a couple of times because it really determines on whether or not your project is going to be considered an infamous failure or uh, if you're going to repeat some of those classic mistakes you to avoid those you really need to understand why are we even doing this and we talk a little bit about that with with Ryan as well so all right without further ado let's get to our interview with Professor Ryan Nelson Professor Ryan Nelson teaches in the undergraduate, graduate, and executive education programs at the University of Virginia's McIntyre School of Commerce, where he's been a recipient of the All University Teaching Award. I can vouch vouch for his expertise personally, since he was one of my professors in the MS in Management of IT program at McIntyre. 
currently serves as the director of the Center for the Management of Information Technology, a position he's held since the founding of the CMIT in 1991. Professor Nelson has published articles and cases on project management, product management, IT adoption, and a variety of academic and professional journals, including the MIS Quarterly Executive, the Communications of the ACM, and the Journal of Management Information Systems, just to name a few. He's also served as a consultant to a, a number of large corporations, including Bank of America, the Texas Air Corporation, CFA Institute, among many others. Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, Ryan. Thanks, Aaron and David. It's great to be here with you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, and you've definitely been a big uh, influence on my career, uh, and uh, as has the whole program at McIntyre. So really happy to have you here today. And we'll be talking today about IT project management, your area of expertise and, and research, and particularly uh, a, a series of topics I know they are very important for you and that you have taught many, many students about, including myself over the years, infamous failures, classic mistakes, and best practices. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of ground to cover there. There's a lot of infamous failures. <laughs> um, maybe maybe we can start a little bit with you kind of telling us a little bit about what um, kind of what is like the definition of a project from your perspective, and what's kind of the um, what what makes this such an important topic. Sure. Um, you know, the basic mission of, of a project is has evolved over thousands of years, but fundamentally, it's always been a, you know a temporary ende- endeavor with defined start stop dates to achieve some sort of unique um, outcome and uh, uh, a series of outputs as a result. And so uh, that's why, because it's it, as you've heard me say, projects are basically the uh, the fundamental unit of work in organizations, you know, since again, the pyramids, uh, the aqueducts, uh, you know, these are you know, how we construct these, uh, these artifacts, uh, how, we, how we run initiatives and in organizations. Uh, as a result, our work gets organized into the structure of a project. Pull a team together, work, you know, give a, a set of, uh, of uh, focused uh, deliverables uh, that we have in mind, and then you, you run through typically a defined uh, budget and, and time frame. And so um, that's why projects have been so important and why we still, they're still around um, after all these years. <laughs> yeah, despite, absolutely. And despite, by the way, the infamous failures and classic mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, can, can you put a number on what that, that cost of failure is? In yeah, management. We, we do talk about this uh, at the beginning of, of each of my classes on project management that and, and and as you know, for the last 22 years, we've we've now done 264 project retrospectives in a couple of hundred different types of organizations. So, you know, through uh, uh, our deliverables, through our MS and the management of IT program, we've we've been in a lot of different companies to see how they they manage their projects, and and we have come up with very similar metrics on failure uh, to the what the Standish Group uh, has come up with for uh, decades. Um, you know, they they've looked at over a hundred thousand projects, and and it's interesting that uh, roughly two out of three projects fail on some significant point you know whether that that failure is an outright failure they pull the plug on it or a failure in terms of not of going over budget or over schedule and so uh those those what we call uh infamous failures are the ones that really get the uh, the most press you know those are the ones that i tend to focus on are the ones that fail at the rate of over a hundred million dollars uh budgets you know they're Unfortunately, a, a lot of those in both the private and public sectors, but there's there are plenty of other failures to go around. Uh, again, at smaller scale uh, scales uh, than that, um, and again, it's usually uh, a failure on one of the key metrics that project management managers are given to focus on. Yeah, and what what are those key metrics again uh, that you would uh, consider uh, yeah. success or failure on? Really, it's that trade-off triangle, you know, the iron triangle of, of on time, on budget, meeting the requirements, 
at, and it, typically, depending on how you specify that, usually as originally defined in the project charter or in the in a contract, in, in the case of a, a third party endeavor. So that's that that uh, that set of failures that really gets us uh, focused on on what are the root causes of those failures, and and that's where there was some work done by uh, Steve McConnell, formerly of Microsoft. He uh, runs a company called Constructs, and he uh, uh, wrote a best-selling book in the 90s called Rapid Development. In that book, he outlined 36 different classic mistakes that we picked up on and have added to. There's there's many more uh, classic mistakes in 36, but we've used that as kind of the foundation for our analysis and our retrospectives over the years. And and it's it's been interesting to see the 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 the, the, the most uh, common of the classic mistakes are uh, estimation and scheduling or poor estimation and scheduling, um, you know, problems with risk management and and then poor uh, planning. Those three and a close fourth is uh, poor stakeholder management. So you kind of, you know, as we study these project failures, we want to know why they failed and, and what are some of the root causes for those failures so, failures so that we can uh, hopefully prevent the failures from happening at the same uh, scale uh, again or uh, at frequency. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it's interesting. I think a lot of those mistakes are very closely correlated with each other, right? If you if you have poor estimation, poor planning for a project, then almost by definition, you're also going to have poor stakeholder management, right? Uh, because those are the things that they're really interested in in knowing from you. How when is this going to be done? How much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. So, so, something that I wanted to say is that I it's is it's always been amazing for me to to when we see the number i mean we we are talking about trillion of uh in i mean trillions in losses per year in it project failure so i, I mean it is it it blows my mind because this is covering not only private sector also the public sector and and yeah. and for me it's particularly a sensitive topic today particularly because um i don't know if you know this but we have like almost like like three weeks or a month in costa rica that um uh the the tax system is 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 down uh it's basically for a hacking uh, event but it's still i mean it is it is an it problem it is an it problem and by itself is a project how how do we get out of this situation and they still don't have even a clue how to get out of it <laughs> and <laughs> i mean and 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 do you think i mean is is the general public i mean the voters aware of the amount of money the governments are losing in 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 bad project management in it and the the, the horrific amount of money they are uh are losing so it's, it's just just mind-blowing that that people is not that aware of this situation i mean the the common folk <laughs> i mean right mm -hmm. the no it people i mean is is my yeah. who, who who may or may not be paying their taxes that go into that uh that loss and there's uh there's a back of a napkin kind of calculation that i like to cite in class about you know how it adds up you mentioned trillions and and really, the, the most current estimate on that is uh, is close to eight trillion dollars per year uh, when it comes to uh, the amount spent uh, on IT uh, projects that have gone um, gone wrong. Again, those those failures, and you can do that. You mentioned Costa Rica. You could take Costa Rica's uh, GDP and multiply it through, you know, to go through this back of the napkin calculation to come out with the amount of failure for for that country. It's about uh, two trillion dollars in the United States each year. You know, again, estimated. Uh, there was a really there was a, a good article that came out in the Harvard Business Review uh, in November of last year that uh, talks about how the project economy has arrived. And as I indicated a few minutes ago, I think we've been in a in a project centric world for thousands of years. But you know, as you kind of look forward, this this is an article written by the former uh, uh, chair of the Project Management Institute. So you know, as 
he's he's really been focused himself on 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 IT and projects in general, um, and he he estimates that the value of project uh, oriented econ uh, economic activity will reach twenty trillion dollars um, by twenty twenty seven, but as you just pointed out, David, you know, we're also talking about a huge set of uh, a huge dollar amount when it comes to, to uh, lost uh, money, whether it comes in, in uh, opportunity costs or straight costs from 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 projects. Yeah, it's, it's more it's more than the money that was invested in that product. It's the opportunity cost of what that project was trying to achieve. Right. You know, one of the uh, what is it? The health, healthcare.gov was one of the infamous failures here in the U.S., kind of a similar scenario to what you described to in terms of just a, a huge impact on the public as a whole. People who have no uh, concept of um, what IT project management is or, or what the classic mistakes are, but are certainly impacted by that. Um, are, are, there, are there any other um, kind of, uh, I'll say, favorite um, <laughs> infamous failures that, that you have, Ryan? Oh, um, one that I, I always like to talk about is the FBI's uh, trilogy project. And um, what happened in that, that was right around the time of, of nine, that 9-11 occurred. And the interesting part of that story is that uh, the mission of, this, uh, of the organization changed dramatically when 9-11 happened. And this is the FBI, uh, who you know used to be you know, really known as a uh, a law enforcement organization. And when 9-11 happened, they, they became much more of a terror, terrorism fighting organization. And when that mission, fundamental mission changed, all of their projects uh, throughout the organization should have changed along with it and adapted with that uh, change in, in mission, but they didn't. And as a result, all of these projects that were you know in flight went to fruition only to find out that their you know, outputs that they uh, were uh, organized to create were no longer relevant. So as a result, I think it was $170 million uh, got written off on, on that particular project, a, a, a section of it. And that's one that, you know, is, is, a, is a real, you know, lesson to be learned that when an organization's strategy changes and today it, it changes faster than ever, uh, with the changing environment, you must, you know, then adapt. Your projects have to adapt along with that. And unfortunately, we're not really set up to do that in most organizations. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, and, and powerful point, right? I think of, you know, for our listeners being engineering managers, generally speaking, they, they're probably being given some sort of directive from executive management on a project that they need to accomplish and a budget and a time frame around that. But what you're highlighting there with the FBI example is how important it is for them to also know the strategy behind that, the reason that they're doing it, right? The, that full project charter, you know, as, as you discussed about it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that means once a year, uh, planning and budgeting cycles uh, that to really come up with what are the portfolio, the prioritized portfolio of projects and programs for the year. And, you know, became the, the, the most innovative companies are ones that try to get that planning cycle down to a quarterly basis. Uh, a few like Capital One really tried to get it down to a, you know, a, a matter of weeks and, and we're having, but we're having, they then found that they had trouble with uh, the, the actual delivery cycles and, you know, how the organization of teams work and the communication cycles, you know, to try to get the uh, any changes that they might want to make uh, recalibrated through throughout the organization and through the, the budget that had already been set. So that's, oh, well, that's, that's, that's great. Deal. Yeah, I, I didn't know that about Capital One. That's that's fantastic because th that gives them the opportunity. I mean, if they have the chance to to review the the planning every few weeks, that that gives the chance to adapt. Is I mean, there's no way for you to adapt if you don't have feed, feedback enough to, uh, I mean, relevant feedback to make a change fast enough. So I, it seems to me what you're saying is that Capital One is is doing fast delivery. So they, they try to deliver fast, um, ship fast. Um, 
their projects. I mean, some to get the deliverables as fast as possible. That's right, and 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 they also have, like a lot of progressive companies uh, have done, is is even push further than that into a, a complete change in mindset from project to product, and that has really uh, kind of broken the cycle of annual the annual planning and, bu and budgeting cycle. So Capital One is, is a great example of one of the, uh, the, the companies that have, have really uh, started to uh, figure out that, you know, just trying to do the planning cycles on a, on a you know, a, a, on a couple of week basis for projects wasn't enough. That was really more of a, a general mindset that was required. I love that. And Professor Nelson, something something I wanted to to point out is in in my experience being a, a, a person in charge of building a product time and time again. Uh, the, the 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 biggest, I mean, as she mentioned, is a bad risk assessment policy is is a, a is is a is one of the reasons of project failure and then poor planning. I, and I'm going to say that when I was, when I doing product, uh, product creation process, the, the thing that I pay attention to most is every single integration point that I have to take into account. So, I mean, there is, there is no product that leaves independent of anything else. I mean, always every single product that we're going to build, every single project, software project, IT project that we do needs to be integrated with something else that already exists. It could be, I mean, services in the cloud, it could be all system, legacy systems, whatever. So they always have to, in, to be integrated with something else. And for me, those are the most important sources of uncertainty always the, those are always the points that will always derail the estimations and you have to go back to the to the estimation that you had before because you never know i mean that how you're going to connect things all the assumptions you had about how the system works the, the system that you have to integrate to how that works what are the the parameters that you have to take into account the the, the workload the, the frequency, that kind of thing. I mean, those assumptions are always wrong. <laughs> always, <laughs> always, always, always. So that's for me, I mean, the, the way that I could manage to get success is to take that as as a as a first class citizen if my concerns about I mean dealing with. I mean it is it is not that you you I mean that it is less cause of uncertainty to build software by itself. I mean the the requirement, just writing the code, that is easy, I think. I mean, compared with now you have to integrate that with the real world. <laughs> that that causes just problems always, every single time. Have you had any experience? Uh, I mean, any any thoughts on that, Professor Nelson? Yes, I mean, as you point out, I mean, the, the, the projects are integrated with with everything else in the internal environment, but the external environment is constantly changing. And as as that happens, um, you know, you you simply have to uh, adapt everything else that you're doing. And so, I, I think one thing that I've I've, I've noticed, I I uh, am fortunate enough to be able to lead class trips uh, from the University of Virginia to Silicon Valley and visit some of the digital native companies you know, like Facebook and, and Google, um, you know, LinkedIn, on and on. And, and each of these companies uh, are, have figured out that they needed to change their entire approach to how work gets done in those organizations. So you know, how to become much more nimble, you know, how can they be adaptive you know, to, to their environment, uh, whether it's external or internal? In all the interconnections, and so, you know, that change in mindset really, you know, became much more of a, a focus on on outcomes over outputs. You know, it, if we're talking about this this iron triangle, you know, we, we've got these uh, 
these budgets and, and defined schedules, but we also have these defined requirements uh, from the very start. And as things change in your environment, you want to be able to change, you know, much more rapidly um, uh, than what even Capital One was able to do with their change in, in, in project approach. And that's what these organizations, uh, whether it's, you know, through uh, changes in delivery cycles, through DevOps, or on the actual construction of, of the products um, through um, a, a different approach. You know, how do you empower? A great book by Marty uh, Kagan uh, called Empowered. Uh, another great book called Inspired that he wrote where he's 10 years ago, where, you know, he really was kind of ca capturing what we have seen on these digital safaris. And that is this new mindset of and, and practice of empowering uh, product managers with um, uh, outcomes uh, in mind. This is the, the you know, sometimes you, you hear uh, OKRs, uh, objectives and key results. Given those OKRs at, the, at uh, you know, at uh, the start of a cycle and then empowering them to do what's necessary with their team to deliver on that goal, um, that outcome. And that's what they have as kind of their North Star. Then everything else that they are, are empowered to do um, is up to them. You know, they will, when they need to reach out and, and, and figure out who else in the organization, in or outside the organization, they need to uh, 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 integrate with, they uh, know to do that. Now, that is up to them to do that, not only what has been predefined in a requirements uh, specification is in the in the project world. So, so that's something that um, um, I've certainly seen, um, you know, a movement that started over, you know, uh, over a decade ago in, in the West Coast in Silicon Valley. That's now, you know, making its way uh, across the country and in uh, in in various places around the world as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's it's when we talk about. Um all these different infamous failures and, in, in, you know, we gave several examples of very uh, public uh, sector failures uh, in our conversation already. It's important to note that, you know, those statistics from the Stanish group and that you've seen in your own research, Ryan, is, is two thirds of projects failing no matter who's working on it, right? So for our listeners, probably two thirds of your projects have failed too, even though they weren't on the nightly news, uh, even though they weren't in the public sector, right? So this is tremendously important at any level of work. Um, what, um, I mean, how, how do we kind of change the thinking in this? And, and it's been, it's been over, uh, 30 years now that you've been leading a center for management of innovative technology, I believe, right? Congratulations on that. So you've seen a lot of changes in the industry. What are some of those most monumental changes that you've seen? What are the changes that we still need to make in our thinking about projects or the way that we work? Well, I mean, one of the one of the things that, you know, I've been uh, preaching for over 20 years is, is the importance of doing retrospectives and, you know, these analysis of what went right and wrong um, on a project. And, um, you know, there are and, and books written about how to do project retrospectives, you know, at, at, at a very large scale and then at, at, a, at a smaller scale, agile retrospectives. And thanks to the agile movement, retrospectives have become a lot more um, common um, uh, than, than they had been. And there was a study done by uh, Gartner that said only 13 percent of organizations do uh, project retrospectives. That that was over 10 years ago today. I would like to believe that most organizations do retrospectives, but in an agile basis at the end of every sprint, uh, even at the end of a, you know, a daily stand up at the end of the day is a form of retrospective. And, and so one of the key things that I have always preached is, is really learning from the past to hopefully prevent those kind of classic mistakes or things that have to happen uh, you know, on a day to day basis from happening uh, going forward. Um, and, and really figuring out, you know, what the root causes are, you know, not just listing those classic mistakes, but zeroing in to figure out what are the root causes in our specific organization that we need to attend to uh, to become a, you know, a more um, effective, productive organization. So that's one. Absolutely. Yeah. What, um, what, what are some of the... Um... 
uh, best practice is to resolve particular classic mistakes. And, and you don't need to go through all 36 of them plus, 36 plus of them, obviously. But, you know, one or two, what are kind of your favorite classic mistakes and how, what are the best practices that we can use these days to help uh, minimize the risk of that mistake? Sure. And, and, and I always I always like to talk about, you know, at least conceptually in your mind, you should kind of have this matrix of best practices that align with certain classic mistakes um, and then customize that for your organization. So, you know, really, you know, agile development is is one uh, best practice that addresses uh, the top three. Uh, classic mistakes, the more, most common ones that we see occurring at over half the projects that we've studied. Um, you know, poor estimation and schedule and poor planning uh, requirements. I mean, sorry, risk management issues. Uh, Agile helps address the issue, fundamental issues with all three of those classic mistakes. So, so that's one, you know, DevOps on delivery, you know, that's, that's another that kind of helps break, you know, certain cycles and behavior patterns, um, you know, you know, that, that occur, um, different, uh, you know, change management, you know, from a, from the soft side of things, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, proper change management, uh, skills, um, really, uh, address a lot of the, the problems in adoption of, of, of whatever, you know, product we end up uh, creating. So, you know, I really encourage organizations to, you know, capture what are the most common issues that they tend to face, and then also try to figure out what are the best practices that um, align with those specific uh, mistakes that you know, show up, occur uh, most frequently in their organizations, and and start, you know, actively, uh, proactively um, addressing those so that they you know, or a, a better, you know, higher achieving organization going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think in, and in terms of, you know, how Agile addresses these, one of the things I've always found most interesting about this idea uh, and, and this, this reality of um, over two thirds projects failing, you know, the, the, as you said, the, the standard for that to, to call a project a failure is that it missed its uh, timeline, its budget, or its scope that was set out for that project in the project charter or whatever at the beginning. Um, and Agile takes a very different approach of that. Of uh, and, and, and the way I often talk to people at if I'm talking to somebody about a new project and they're saying, you know, I need you to do this in this budget by this timeline. Um, I always say, well, which one of those three legs of the stool is most important to you? Which is the one that you don't, under any condition, you don't want me to change? You know, you have an absolutely fixed budget that under no condition I can exceed, or this, you know, I can give you less features, but it has to be done by this date. You know, pick one, because you can't have all three of those in most cases, right? And I think agile methodologies uh, in, enable that sort of conversation and give you a way to manage towards that, that doesn't take the assumption that all three of those are going to be fixed up front. And, and just that one simple change in mindset is, I think, fundamental to being on the, the, the 30% of projects that succeed. Because if you acknowledge up front that, you know, maybe our scope is flexible as long as we're hitting the timeline and budget, then it's not necessarily a failure, right? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 all, it's, it's really a change in perspective that, that changes it from a failure to a success in the way that you work together and set those expectations. Yeah, it's really amazing to me that we've been uh, practicing under that, uh, that definition of success for so many, so long. And as you pointed out that, and this was something I observed when my students would come back to present the retrospective findings uh, in class that they'd say, all right, you know, technically this, 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 this project was a failure because it was over budget or, you know, didn't meet the, the requirements as, as uh, originally uh, specified. Yet when we ask our clients, you know, the people were, were the, in the organization of the, uh, for the project we're studying, if it was this, the project was a success or failure, they still are saying it was a success. So they were very- right, A frustrated. successful failure, right? <laughs> yeah. So that, that led to the, to the phrase, a successful failure, because um, it was a success in their view, because the, the, the outputs were the product that was produced was being used and was adding value to the organization. So even though it was late, 
you know, uh, uh, it was over budget. Um, it was still at the end uh, considered to be a success, uh, a failed failure on the process side, uh, a success on the outcome side. So right. that um, um, that's something that that tend to stick. And, and, and I mentioned this article that was in HBR recently, and in that article it tends to point to that same concept, you know, that. Yeah, this author gets into the the, the same um, you know thought that you, you know really need to be much more outcome driven. And it, it, one thing I like that that he and a few other authors have also come up with is is something called the Project Canvas. It's it's if you've heard of the business model canvas, you know a a very lean way to capture a business model of a of a firm. Well, it's the same concept applied to projects. So. Uh, in this article, he proposes a, a canvas for capturing and, and very importantly, the, you know, what, what is the goal right off the bat, the goal of this, the, of this project. And so, you know, it's the right, it's the right um, approach. Um, it still, it still encounters the, the same problems uh, that we've been talking about in terms of uh, that are, are inherent to, to, to a project mindset, but it gets at it, it addresses you know one of the, the the major ones and that's put front and center the outcome first and then try to push in the background some of the other key metrics of of you know budget um uh scope um and time yeah yeah i mean whether you're using a project canvas or a charter or mm -hmm. you know, like amazon has their their two pagers their six pager mm -hmm. documents you know whatever those the sort of framework is that you're using. I think the most important thing about all of those is establishing that that common understanding in the team at the beginning of the project of, you know, what's the strategy behind this? Why are we doing this? How will we judge success, right? Because in, you know, back to those, that iron triangle of, of time and scope and budget, if, if the team is not clear on which one or more of those three items is the flexible one and which one or more is the inflexible one, then they're going to make poor choices that ultimately determine whether it's a successful failure or a failed failure, <laughs> right? Um, or, or hopefully a total success. But they have to understand that, you know, these are the, the because we're this is the outcome we want, because this is the strategy behind this, it's most important that we do this. Uh, it's most important that we achieve this part of that iron triangle. And yeah, I think all of these, these, these frameworks are, are great for doing that. And that's perhaps the most crucial thing is making sure that there's that common understanding, uh, across the engineering leadership, the business leadership, executive leadership, down to the individual developers and testers building that product. That's right. And you know, the, the good news is that, the, you know, more and more organizations are starting to figure this out. Uh, more and more universities are figuring out how to teach some of this uh, change in mindset. You know, for the last half dozen years, I'm, you know, our, we, we have more, we not only have a project management class, but a product management class uh, to really kind of, you know, cover the gambit of, uh, of, of work activities out there. There's a book, you, as, as you know, we, we got our lead, lead off uh, keynote speaker on, on uh, Friday's program is Peter High, who last year published a book uh, called, called Getting to Nimble. And in that book, he features uh, a number of, of organizations that happen to be, you know, in close proximity to the University of Virginia. Capital One, we've already talked about, uh, CarMax and The Washington Post. And so we have, uh, following his keynote, we have a panel of representatives, chief information officers and, and uh, executive vice presidents from those three organizations. They're going to talk about um, more or less some of the same things we've been talking about. You know, ha what have they changed about their transformed within their organizations to allow them to uh, be much uh, more nimble, um, you know, faster to adapt? You know, so that you know they are constantly uh, reevaluating those outcomes and the ROI that they need out of the uh, product they're building, and all the other things associated with that from a cultural and structural uh, perspective as well. Yeah. Now, now that you mention those things, our uh, most of our audience is 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 concerned about growing I and mean, scaling. 
Um, and so in your opinion, what are the, the yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems to me, oh, before asking your opinion, it seems to me that the same principles you are mentioning about the definition of the project uh, should consider also the consequences of bringing in people into the organization to execute the project. I mean, all the cultural changes, all, I mean, the onboarding processes, uh, how to gradually add people so, so it makes sense. Uh, I mean, maybe not all at once, all the people that we need, because it's, it's impossible to deal with all of that chaos, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, do you have any kind of advice for that? I mean, for growing, for scaling up people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've written case studies on CarMax and the Washington Post to look back and, again, more or less an organizational retrospective of their digital transformation uh, that they that each of, the, of them has uh, been the journey they've been going through for uh, roughly about 10 years each. And what the, each of them did in terms of scale, scaling is start small, start with one product team that is operating under under the, the, the new practices of and, and mindset that we've been talking about and then see how successful it is and why they end up being successful and then to try to start scaling by adding a second and then a third product oriented team while project oriented teams are still operating in those organizations and then um, eventually CarMax, when uh, by the time I finished writing my uh, case study on them a few years ago, they had approximately 30 product teams. Well, they now have well over 50 uh, product teams. The, the, the interesting thing about scalability um, is that you, you then need to pull all of, all of those um, 50 plus product teams uh, together periodically to make sure that you're all heading as an organization in the same direction. You don't want uh, product teams, you know, heading in it with substantively different uh, strategies in mind. So there still needs to be some uh, form of um, organizing mechanism to communicate organizational strategy to the product teams and then to feed that back up. And so CarMax has uh, open houses uh, every couple of weeks that are, are fascinating to watch because each each product team will present um, what uh, what they've been doing for the last two weeks and what they plan to be doing over the next two weeks. They, they talk about any of the major challenges that they're having. And in that meeting, um, the CIO of the organization, the COO of the organization, the CMO, marketing officer of the organization, are, are present. And so they're engaged in this communication of strategy uh, as well as delivery in an ongoing basis. So scalability, you know, is, is an important thing that you, you've got to, you, you have to begin to address very quickly. I mean, it's, it's the same with uh, the, the, the practices behind agile and scaled agile. Uh, there are other new practices that um, uh, you know, value streams uh, in organizations. And, and then, you know, how can you convert? I think you had um, a guest on to talk about the conversion from a project or program management office to a, um, a, an agile value management organization. That's what needs to happen in organizations. They, they need to actually start reconstructing themselves um, to you know, adopt you know, this new mindset and set of practices as well that are very, very, very different. And that's, that's the, the key challenge, not like flipping a switch. If you think back to you know, what happened between waterfall and, and agile, you know, you know, whether you're Capital One or another organization, you don't do it overnight. You know, it's more like a, a, a decade long process of making that change, you know, that change management uh, that's required uh, to make that shift in mindset, the culture, the organizational structure, the, you know, how are you, um, you know, how are organizations, you, as you brought it up, David, you know, onboarded and, 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 and trained? um uh to to work in that in that new environment
because it's very different. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it, Ryan, you already brought up a you know one one really important concept, and yeah, we had a, a prior guest on the podcast, Sanjeev Augustine from LifeSpeed, uh, LifeSpeed, talking about moving from a project management office concept to a value management office, and so that that idea of moving from managing projects to managing value streams certainly something agile scaling methods talk about. Uh, as as we start to wrap up here, I want to ask one more uh, uh, question for you, a little controversial here. Um, and see see what you think. You know, there was an interesting article in, in Harvard Business Review recently by the title, Do We Still Need Teams? And making the making the, the case that, you know, with all of the disruption that we've seen due to the pandemic in, in remote working, or hybrid models and all of that, they made the, 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 the statement here that now, I'll read a little bit from it here. The, the level of variance that hybrid teamwork creates has never been seen before in organizational life and is bringing many managers to the breaking point, end quote. And they say that uh, later in the article, quote, that true teams have a shared mindset, a compelling joint mission, defined roles, stable membership, high interdependence, and clear norms, end quote, which... I would agree with that, but their point, I guess, is that in this new form of work, that means we can't really have teams anymore. Uh, or, or it's it's they don't say it that assertively. To be fair, uh, it's it's more and more difficult. And so the question is: Do we still need teams, and do we still need projects uh, in our mindset at all, or are we moving towards something entirely different? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, a huge proponent of teams, um, high functioning teams, of course, uh, that um, I'm, as you know, we, we have a number of uh, classes at, at UVA and, and the McIntyre School of Commerce in particular that are focused on um, how to uh, manage teams, how to lead teams. We have organizational behavior faculty that are very adept at, you know, teaching um, you know, not just the, the, the knowledge and the concepts around teams, but the actual practice of how to create, you know, the, uh, the forming, uh, you know, uh, norming, storming approach to, to team um, uh, building and, and effective teams. And so um, that's, that's also how the, I think the best work gets done. I mean, and when I think about uh, diversity and innovation, it doesn't happen when you're you're working by yourself in your home office. It's it's really working with, um, and ideally, uh, in many cases, and Marty Kagan is a big proponent of this as well. Co-located teams. Mm -hmm. So you know that's been the big challenge over the last couple of years is how to how to have you know high highly functional teams that are cannot be co-located. We actually did a case study two years ago on Willow Tree, which is a, 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 a you know, digital products firm that is located in, in uh, head, headquartered in Charlottesville, but has uh, multiple offices around the U.S. And, and they just finished two years ago as the pandemic was starting a, a brand new uh, building uh, headquarters uh, facility that they couldn't move into. So yeah. um, that, <laughs> it, it was a beautiful empty building. Yeah, beautiful oh, empty building in a nice part of Charlottesville, right on the river. And, uh, and so that was how that case was written up. You know, what do they do? I mean, how can yeah. they try to replicate some of the practices that they're highly effective teams? And, and by the way, this was a condition. They had these conditions that when they sign a contract with one of their clients, they have the set of conditions that they expect. And one of them is co-location of the teams. Uh, that's really a practice, a best practice for you know for building products and they they couldn't do it so um it's been a huge challenge for them um to to work with you know there are a lot of tools as you know that um they can use to help address that you know whether they're whiteboarding you know collaborative whiteboarding you know tools or or other uh forms for communication and and, and so forth uh video um and so forth but we're now going to go back in um uh, in just a couple of weeks to do a B case on Willow Tree to find out, you know, what has happened over the two years? What are, you know, realizing that this has been a major challenge, what have you learned about those? Um, so 
I, I'm still, I, I understand the point about, you know, teams are hard, you know, at, uh, it's for a lot of reasons, you know, the you know, communication requirements, you know, the uh, keeping everybody on the same page, you know, how do you get the right, you know, blend of, of skills and, and organization, but um, really, you know, I don't see, you know, uh, other than, you know, trying to, to become very task, you know, very specifically task oriented to say, all right, you're going to do this task. And then that sounds like waterfall to me, right? We're going to throw it over right, the wall. Exactly. You know, <laughs> here's what we need, throw it over the wall and then expect that um, we're going to get back what we threw, what we expected. And, and that just doesn't operate that well. Now there are certain, yeah. probably certain, you know, uh, certain initiatives that might work fine in that kind of a model. But I think generally speaking in, in our world, again, the digital products world, I think, you know, that, that yeah, te- teams are still the way to go. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and yeah, we don't want to go back to a throwing tasks over the wall because then we're going to be repeating a lot of the same classic mistakes that you talked about. You can't, you can't uh, give someone a two day task uh, and expect them to deliver it with the same common shared understanding that a team has of why are we doing this work? What are the goals for it? What are the what are the standards of the work that we're doing? You know, all of those things that a, that a team can develop that shared understanding. I do think it's it's critical, and I think that you know, personally speaking, I think it's just this has been a shock for a lot of companies going to remote, and so they're feeling some extreme, uh, you know. Uh, 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 difficulty in that change, right? But, you know, David and I have, have, have been working with remote teams for over a decade now. Stick with it. You could still have a great team dynamic and be remote uh, and be distributed. And I think companies are starting to figure that out. Um, and, you know, the last thing we want to do is is swing the pendulum back in another direction um, and 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 start to repeat these classic mistakes again. We've we've had enough infamous failures. It'd be nice to swap that uh, statistic and start to see seventy percent of projects failing, and instead of only seventy uh, percent of projects succeeding, instead of seventy percent of projects failing. So here, here, that's right. Uh, very good. Here, here. I'm full throttle in, this, <laughs> in this conversation. Well, Ryan, uh, in in a in yet another example of poor estimation abilities, which I regularly demonstrate personally in terms of time estimation of of talking, we have gone over the amount of time I told you we were going to talk. Uh, but I think the value delivered this has been still a very successful failure in in time management on my part because this has been a great conversation with you. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to just give you a, a a a quick shout out to you and and to University of Virginia. Uh, McIntyre School of Commerce, the Emerson Management of IT program there that 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 I graduated from, and how we met. Um, you know, I, I think it it uh, over ten years ago since I joined that, but it was really. Uh, uh, real turning point in my career personally. I had been an engineer prior to that. Most of the project management skills that I had were self learned up to that point, and it was it was uh, tremendously both affirming of what I knew and was doing well, as well as educational about the many things I was not doing well. And uh, and that program really gave me personally the confidence to then go out and become an agile coach and trainer after that, which then led into this beautiful decade plus of work with David and and building this international company. And, you know, uh, it, it's just been a wonderful journey in McIntyre and, 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 and you were a part of that. So I want to thank you uh, publicly for that. And anybody looking for a program, it's a great one to join. Uh, you don't have to be in Charlottesville to do it. Uh, and uh, a lot of great benefits from that. You mentioned you know, this Friday after we're recording, it'll be a knowledge continuum that you're leading. So even over a decade later, alumni still join at these events and we continue to learn from each other. So thank you very much for that, Ryan, for everything you and Stefano and Barb and all of the wonderful professors that I had in that program uh, for all that you uh, did for me and continue to do for others. Well, I appreciate that very much, um, Aaron. This has been a great conversation with you and David. Um, uh, yeah. David, uh, as you know, Aaron's what we call uh, a definition of a successful success. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was yeah. I was about to ask that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure, so I appreciate yeah, your uh, vouch of support. <laughs> I was yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. That's just right. Kidding. Uh, we we uh, one thing that we love the most about our program is is the ability to learn from our students, and that's certainly been the case 
uh, with Aaron. So, uh, oh, that's so nice. Yeah, I mean, I I can attest that as well. I mean, I learn from him a lot every day. So yeah, it's <laughs> I can say he's a successful success. Uh, it does does like. <laughs> Should have a t-shirt like that. Yeah. <laughs> I have a successful success. Yeah. I appreciate the kind words from both of you. I'm going to get that tattooed right after this uh, before either of you change your mind. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for your time. Thanks for joining us on the Scaling Tech Podcast, where we help you manage your growing engineering team. Brought to you by agilityfeet.com experts in staffing engineering teams in Latin America for clients globally. For more information on today's episode and to submit your ideas for future guests, please visit scalingtechpod.com.